thank you. I, I, I guess I guess your word doesn't count for much. I heard more no's than yeses. I'll stay quiet. Um, so inequality, we, we hear every day almost, every time you open the newspaper, we hear how this is a major problem and a major issue of our time. It, almost every problem in the world today from, uh, you know, conflict in the Middle East to climate change has been at some point or another blamed on the issues surrounding inequality. Suddenly, many of our economic issues have been blamed on the gap, and it's a gap between whether income or wealth, between those who are defined as the top 1%, those who have a lot, and those who have only a few. And, and the economic problems, the list is long from slow economic growth in the West, we've seen a significant decline in grow, economic growth rates in Western Europe, in the UK, in the United States, over the last certainly since the, the Great Recession, since the financial crisis, but even before that, growth rates have been trending downwards towards 1% to 2%, <coughs> rather than the historic growth rates of 3 4%, which uh, the West benefited from uh, during, the, during the 20th century. Uh, people complain that inequality is somehow holding back the poor so that we have a reduction in mobility between poverty and the middle class, or between the middle class and, and, uh, and uh, wealthier classes. We're seeing less mobility, again, across all Western societies. And, and when I say Western, I would include those relatively free market places like Japan, South Korea, and places like that. And, and low economic growth over the last few years is typical of those economies as well. So mobility has come down. So it's harder for poor people, we are told, to rise up to become middle class than it used to be 30, 50, 100 years ago. And the cause, we are told, is inequality. Uh, this idea of blaming pretty much all of our problems on this gap, on the gap between wealthy and those who are not wealthy, uh, really, you know, got a lot of momentum from uh, Thomas Piketty. You probably heard of Thomas Piketty, probably uh, one of the most famous economists out there in the world. Um, book, Capital in the 21st Century, which came out a few years ago and, and became, a, in spite of the fact that it's a very, very thick book, uh, became an instant bestseller on, on pretty much all the lists. I don't think anybody, oh, I don't think very many people actually read the book, uh, but a lot of people bought it. It's one of those books you have to have on your bookshelf in order to appear sophisticated and well-read. Uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, Thomas McKinney really gave this uh, motivation. Since then, the whole issue of inequality has become a major debating point. But is there anything there? Is there an issue of inequality? <coughs> now, there is a gap. And arguably, depending on how you measure it, and there's a lot of debates, and, and the debate doesn't make the press because it's not an interesting, it's not interesting for the press to reveal this kind of stuff. But there's a lot of debate in the economics literature about whether this gap has actually grown anywhere near as much as people like Thomas McKinney claim it has grown. Uh, there's a lot of literature in the, in, in the world of economics today showing that indeed Piketty exaggerates this gap, that his data is flawed, that the way they measure it is wrong, and so on. And, but I'm not going to argue about that because I don't think it's really that important whether the, the, the gap has grown or shrunk or where it's happened because I'm going to argue that inequality doesn't matter. It has no relevance to anything in life. It's not the cause of slow economic growth. It's not the cause of low mobility. It's not the cause of poverty. It's not the cause of social unrest. It's not the cause of any problems that we have. And we should be completely indifferent to the issue of inequality, even if Piketty's right and it is expanding. I think he's wrong just on the economics, just on the data side of it. But I'm going to ignore that, and we're not going to do econometrics here anyway, right? But this is not a, not a good forum to do statistics and to do data analysis. So we're going, to, we're going to accept the common view that inequality has grown, in spite of the fact that I think that is not true. So what's the issue with inequality? 
Why is inequality a problem? Remember, inequality is the gap in the amount of income we have or the amount of wealth we have, depending on which inequality you choose to have, between those who have a lot and those who have a little. In what sense is this gap problematic from an economic perspective? And then we can talk about from a philosophical, moral perspective. It's really weird to have somebody sitting in front of me with his back to me. <laughs> it's okay, but it's uh, just strange for me. Um, <laughs> in what sense is this gap problematic economically? Well, economically, there really is no argument that this gap is problematic. I don't know of a single economic argument presented in the literature that says that a gap is a problem. The only semblance of an argument is often presented, uh, presented supposedly as a Keynesian argument, but I don't think Keynes would appreciate this. Um, and that is the idea that from a purely economic perspective, the problem with having a lot of accumulation of wealth at the top is what do rich people do with their money? What a real question. What do rich people do with their money? They invest it. Right? No, they don't invest it. No, I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> the answer you want to say. No, it's not the answer I wanted. It was too good of an answer. I wanted to, I, I wanted I want somebody to say they hoard it. So they can say hoard? What is they that? Hoard it. They hoard it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if your generation knows who Scooge McDuck is. Do you know Scooge yeah. McDuck? The cartoon. And and in the cartoon he's this really, really, really rich duck, right? And he loves to go to his uh, to this vault that he has where he's, where he's holding all his money, and he goes and he swims with the gold coins because you know that's nobody does that. Nobody stuffs their money in the mattress. What do they do with their money? They invest it or they save it. They put it in the bank. But what does the bank do with the money? The bank can't make any money if it just sits in the vault. What do they have to do with the money to make money? Yeah. Invest. So the argument is that the problem with a lot of people having a lot of wealth is they invest the money. And we know, supposedly, supposedly this is common knowledge, that what really drives the economy is what? What drives economic growth? What drives economic growth? Investment. Spending. <laughs> Hoarding. <laughs> you've, got a, you've got a handle on this. This is good. Consumption drives economic growth. It's spending that drives economic growth. And the problem with rich people is they don't spend enough. And they don't. As a percentage of their income, it's called the propensity to, to consume. Their rich propensity to consume is small. Poor people consume everything that they get because they have to, to survive. The middle class consumes much of what they get. And then they save a little bit. Rich people save most of their money and consume very little. So the idea is consumption drives the economy. So we need to get the money into the hands of people who consume, because that's what will drive economic growth. But that's utter sheer nonsense. Consumption doesn't drive the economy. It can't drive the economy. It's production that drives the economy. Creating stuff, building stuff, making stuff that drives economic growth over the long run. Yes, a short run, you can stimulate the economy with consumption and economic growth will grow up a little bit. But then it declines. Unless you've got sustained investment and production going on. Think about it this way. You go and you spend money on clothes or food or whatever, right? Consumption. How did you get the money to spend? What did you have to do to get the money to spend it? You had to create something. You had to produce. So before you can consume, you have to produce. And then where did the stuff that you consume come from? Somebody had to produce it. So indeed, for every act of consumption, there's at least two acts of production. The production of the product that you're consuming and the fact that you, in order to get the money, had to produce something. Production is what drives an economy. Consumption, by the way, is very easy. Right? I don't know anybody who, if I give him a nice amount of money and stick him in the middle of the mall, won't consume. 
Consumption is easy. We're all very good at it. The hard part in life is the production. It's the creation. It's the building. That takes real effort, real thinking. Consumption happens. If you want to stimulate an economy, you stimulate it by through production, not through consumption. One of the reasons economic growth is so low in Western economies is we bought into this consumption mythology and we keep thinking we'll consume ourselves to prosperity and we hit a brick wall every single time we try it. Japan has been trying this for 30 years. For 30 years it's been trying to consume itself into and it just doesn't work. So there is no economic theory. No economic theory. That links inequality, this gap, and the idea of economic success. In spite of the fact that it's repeated over and over again in newspapers and articles that there is a relationship, nobody's ever articulated actual theory to show that relationship. It doesn't exist. Indeed, the primary concern regarding inequality is not an economic one. It's a moral, ethical one. It's an issue of fairness, we are told. We're told it's just unfair that some people have a lot and others have a little. And often, you know, people use this analogy of uh, a pie, right? There's a pie, call it wealth in the United Kingdom. And some people have a lot of the pie, and some people just have a little bit of the pie, and that's not fair. Because what do we assume? Like when somebody walks into a room with a big pizza, and we're all sitting around and we're going to eat the pizza, what do we assume kind of implicitly in that act? The, how are we going to divide this pizza? Equally. Equally. We just, that's just an assumption we make. Because, you know, as kids, we probably measured whether our siblings got exactly the same amount of pizza as we did, or the exact same amount of Coca-Cola, whatever it happened to be that we did, because we thought that was what fairness meant, is equality. And indeed, generally, we've come, there's this modern idea that fairness equals equal. We'll talk about whether that's true or not. So this idea that there's a pie, and the pie arrives, and we should be dividing it equally, and wait a minute, but when I look at this pie of wealth, a pie of income, it's not divided equally, so something's wrong here. Something's not fair. Some people are getting more than others. Now, why is this not right? What's the difference between a pie and an economy? The pie is what? It's in size. But it's fixed in size. The pie's fixed. So if I get a big piece, what does that mean for you? Small. You get less, right? Zero sum. Anytime I get more, you get less. So there's this notion that the economy is fixed in size. And anything one person gets, the wealth of one person is, comes at the expense of somebody else. So based on this reasoning, if somebody is wealthy, in a, in a sense they have caused somebody else to be poor. Because they've taken a bigger piece of the pie, and all they've left is a smaller piece. Now is that true? Is an economy a fixed pie? Why not? What's true of an economy? It's growing. It's growing. It's not fixed. It's constantly growing. And it has the potentially constantly to grow. And transactions, economic transactions, are not zero sum. So, I like using my iPhone. I, you know, I paid a thousand dollars for this. A lot of money. Right? Why did I pay a thousand dollars for this? How much is it worth to me if I paid a thousand dollars for this? More than a thousand. Right? More than a thousand. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bought it. Now, it turns out this is worth, to me at least, a lot more than a thousand dollars. Right? I don't know how you use your phones. But, and none of you remember a time when these didn't exist, I know that, 
I remember when these didn't exist, and the difference in my life between this and know this is unbelievable. I travel around the world a lot. I can now video conference with my kids, read them a bednight story from anywhere in the world at a cost of, how much does it cost me? No, zero. Once I paid the thousand, it's gone, right? Zero. Every one of those calls, marginal no cost is zero. I can listen to every piece of music ever composed at a marginal cost of zero. I can navigate using GPS and maps all over, anywhere, any city that I've never been to. I can get to where I need to be at a marginal cost of zero. This is an amazing tool. It's worth tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to me. And to recreate this, 20 years ago, you couldn't have recreated it even if you'd spent millions and millions of dollars. You couldn't recreate what this has now in my pocket. So I bought this for ten for thousand dollars. It's worth to me much more than that. So my life is better off by orders of magnitude more than the thousand dollars I spent on this. And did Apple lose anything when they gave this to me for thousand dollars? No, I mean they're pretty juicy profit margins in these things. So Apple won, and I won, we're both better off, $1,000 transacted between us, Apple got what, richer by $1,000, I got poorer by $1,000, according to economists, because all they can measure are dollars, but did I get poorer? In life, in experience, in my ability to access what makes life worthwhile, my kids, music, no, I got richer. So I'm better off, Apple's better off, and yet from an accounting perspective, which is what Piketty is very good at, I got poorer and Apple got richer. The pie grew when I bought an iPhone. By the very fact of buying an iPhone, the pie grew. Because Apple got a profit and I got spiritual pleasure. You laugh, but that's what life's about. I mean, I'll give you one other example. How many of you read Harry Potter? Everybody? That's good. Well, I mean, Harry Potter is awful. <laughs> <laughs> because we've all read it, all of us, right? Every single one of those books. I had to buy at least two copies of every single one of those books because each one of my sons wanted to read it and I wanted to, I listened to it on tapes, I wanted to get the tapes and then we had to go see every single one of the 95 different movies made, right? And I spent, I don't know, $3,000 on Harry Potter over the lifetime. A lot of money. I'm significantly poorer because of Harry Potter. And at the same time, this multiplies the evil of this book. At the same time, J.K. Rawlings had the audacity to become a billionaire. Off of me. And off of all of you, or your parents at least. Who all got poorer at the same time. She got rich, and we all got poorer. That's inequality for you. It's exactly what inequality is. J.K. Rawlings got rich off of your consumption of her books which made you poor. Now that doesn't sound right, because it's not right. It's true that she got richer, and it's true that from an accounting perspective we got poorer, but where did, what happened here? Why did we buy the Harry Potter books? Because they were fun. Because they made life better. Because they were, you know, it was really cool to be able to read the same book my kids were reading and talk about it afterwards and have the same kind of experience. And $3,000 was nothing to have that experience. And the fact that J.K. Rollins is a billionaire is wonderful that she became a billionaire making our lives better. She grew the pie. She didn't shrink it. She made it bigger. And I would argue, and you can challenge me in the Q&A, that every billionaire out there Who's done it honestly? Who's done it honestly? Has made the pie bigger by being a billionaire. Indeed, you cannot become a billionaire. Again, assuming you did it honestly. 
unless you make the world a significantly better place to live. You cannot become a billionaire without making the world a significantly better place to live for millions, if not hundreds of millions of people. Indeed, that's what it takes to become a billionaire. To become a billionaire, you have to create a product that people are willing to pay for more than what it costs you to produce. Why are they willing to pay you for the product? Because they believe it'll make their life better by more than what they're willing to pay you. And how many people need to be able to do this for you to become a billionaire? Well, millions and millions and millions of them. Indeed, hundreds of millions of people. That's how you become a billionaire. By making their lives better. Thus, by making the world a better place to live. So, the pie is constantly growing. And the pie is constantly growing not in ways that it's easy for economists to measure because they cannot measure my utility of reading Harry Potter. There's no number you can attach to that. Say, okay, he gave up, up $3,000, but he got X. What's the X? The X is... But there's even a bigger problem with this pie analogy beyond the fact that it's cooked. Wow. And that is... <laughs> There is no pie. There is no such thing as the wealth of the UK. There is no such thing as the income of the UK. You can't aggregate stuff like that. I mean, you might bake a pie, and you might bake a pie, and you might bake a pie, and I bake a pie. And then what you want to do, the people who use the pie analogy, is squish them all together and pretend like there's a national pie. But there is no national pie. You get to bake your pie and keep your hands off of mine. I'll bake my pie, eat my pie, trade with you maybe, maybe we can trade pies. But you don't get to take my pie and then decide who gets pieces of it. Indeed, we all bake our own pies, and some people, from a purely economic perspective, bake small pies, and some people bake massive pies. Billionaires bake huge pies by making the world a better place to live, by influencing the lives of millions of people around them. They make huge pies. But they're their pies. They're not my pies. They're not the British government's pies. They're not Thomas Piketty's pies. Although Thomas Piketty has done very, very well and he's baked himself. A massive pie. Okay. I love it when people give speeches on the evils of inequality and they charge like $100,000 to do it. Okay. Paul Krugman actually charges $250,000 to describe how evil inequality is. <laughs> Talk about hypocrisy. Um, no. I mean, the fact that we have different amounts of wealth is because we create different amounts of wealth. We create different sizes of pies. We provide different quantities of values to other people. We don't force other people to buy our stuff. We don't force other people to trade with us. People trade with us because they believe it's in their self-interest to trade with us. <laughs> and therefore they are better off. We are better off. And yeah, I land up with a bigger pie than otherwise. So the whole pie analogy is wrong because it collectivizes the pie. It denies the fact that as individuals who create our own pies, our own wealth, our own income. If you have an idea that changes the world, you're going to make a lot of money. If you never have an idea that changes the whole world, you're probably not going to make a lot of money. Some of us, some of us choose to be teachers. There's probably a few people who want to get a PhD and become a professor at a university. You know what? You'll never be rich. <laughs> You'll just never be rich. And that's a choice you've made. And, and my guess is that if you're going to get a PhD, you're probably really smart. And you could work at the city and make a lot of money. But you're choosing not to make a lot of money. That's okay. 
Because life is not about money. As Harry Potter illustrates, right? We'd rather read the book than keep the money in our pocket. Life's about a lot of things. And each one of us makes choices about our own hierarchy of values, about the things that are most important to us. And we don't, as a rule, place money at the top. So some of us will never make a lot of money. So inequality is a consequence, at least to some extent, of the choices we make. And this idea, this obsession with how much money we make and how much wealth we have is missing the whole point. It's about life. It's about living, which you need some money for. But, you know, I don't envy billionaires. Good for them. But I chose not to try to make as much money as I could. I'd rather do this, this. What I do right now is more fun for me than having gazillions of dollars on the side. Right? And each one of us will make our choices. I, I told my kids, who are about older than you actually, at this point, I'm getting old. Um, I told them, follow your passion. <laughs> and they did. Right? So they're poor. <laughs> one writes comedy and one's a musician. You know, that's what you get for following your passion. But that's what life's about. <coughs> that's what life's about. And this obsession that people who talk about inequality constantly have with money is misplaced, misguided. So, I don't think there's any problem with inequality. Indeed, if I took the group of people here, right, just to just give a good sample of, well, somewhat of a sample of at least part of humanity anyway, um, and I put you in a desert island, with, you know, and you start off completely equal, put you in a desert island with nothing. Guess what? I come back five years later, and you can all be equal in terms of money, in terms of wealth, in terms of income. No. You'll all be unequal. Indeed, we're all metaphysically unequal. We're all different. Some of you on this desert island will work really, really hard and, and create stuff. Some of you won't. Like, it's a really nice desert island and there's a lot of sun and you can take in the sights and you can go swimming and you don't want to work that hard. There's enough fish and enough fruit that you don't have to accumulate much stuff. So you won't. Some of you will have a genius idea to make life on that island much, much better, and you'll sell it to the rest, and you'll make gazillions of dollars equivalent on the island. Some of you won't. Some of you become teachers on the island. Whatever. The point is that if you take a group of people and leave them free, free of what? What does freedom mean? When we say freedom, what do we mean? Having as much power as we want. <laughs> I don't think that's freedom, right? It, it, that would be like uh, that would be like saying, you know, I want to fly and I'm not free because I can't fly. That, 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 that's a meaningless concept. What do, what do we mean? Or what do most political thinkers historically have meant when they talk about freedom? Non-intervention. Yeah, no, no coercion, no force. So if you're not allowed to steal from each other, but otherwise, you're left alone. The outcome will be that we're different. Because we're different. We have different values, different choices, different skills, different abilities. We're just different. Which is beautiful, by the way, because life would be unbelievably boring if we were all the same, even if everybody was like me. It would be terrible. One of the great benefits of life is the fact that we are different and have different interests and skills and abilities and values. So, freedom. Freedom leads inevitably to, equality, to inequality. Freedom necessitates inequality because we are different. And indeed, the only way to bring about equality is to reduce the amount of freedom we have. It's to use coercion and force and violence to take from some and give to others. It's to impose our will in terms of what, it, what we think, whoever the we is, fill in the blank, majority, the government, the people in power, think, is the appropriate level. 
So we take from some and give to others. Thus, by the way, reducing investment and therefore reducing long-term economic growth. We're going to put aside the economics, right? You cannot get equality if you value freedom. Equality, any kind of equality of outcome, is a consequence of a reduction in the amount of freedom. The introduction of coercion into human affairs. The introduction of violence into human affairs. There's only one sense in which equality means anything political. In a document I know all you, you guys hate, which I happen to love, the U.S. Declaration of Independence. <laughs> they write, the Founding Fathers of America write, all men are created equal. <coughs> now, granted, they didn't completely mean it, right, because they had slaves and women didn't count and so on, but what was the theoretical implication of what, they, what was meant by that statement? Did they mean that we're all going to be equal in outcome? Did they mean we're all going to have the same stuff? What do they mean when they say all men are created equal? Equality of opportunity. Well, what does that even mean? What does equality of opportunity mean? Equal rights. We'll get to that. Let's finish opportunities. <laughs> because what are opportunities? Like, are any two people going to have the same opportunities ever in life? Is an opportunity just another outcome? We're all going to have different parents. Our parents, therefore, are going to provide us with different opportunities. We're all going to go to different schools. Therefore, they're going to have different opportunities. Opportunity is just another outcome. I know it's the nice thing conservatives say because they want to be for equality. So they use opportunity instead of outcome and they think they're, 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 they're you know, somehow defeating the left. But no, it's the same thing. It's a complete sellout. The only equality that has any meaning politically is equality of rights or equality of liberty or equality of freedom. It's the idea that every human being is free to live their life using their own mind in pursuit of their own values the way they see fit and as long as they don't interfere in other people's pursuit, physically interfere in other people's pursuit of their lives, they should be left alone. Equality of rights means that we're all politically, from the perspective of the law, from the perspective of the protection that the government provides us, all equal before the law, equal in our liberties, equal in our freedoms. That's what it means. And the problem is that any attempt to reduce inequality violates our rights. Because it involves using coercion to take from us. Now, I'll give you a historical example of what I think equality, this idea of obsession with inequality and a push towards equality actually leads to. It's just a true story. A group of intellectuals um, went to school in Paris with some of the you know, most famous philosophers of the time uh, who taught egalitarianism and equality, and equality was everything, and equality was important, and this is what you had to achieve in life. And they, they were, they were young and, and idealistic and ambitious, and they, they committed that if they ever got into political power, if they ever got the reins of power, they would bring about this utopia. They would manifest this equality in the lives of their people. And lo and behold, they achieved political power in their country. And now they had an opportunity to bring about equality. They looked around, and uh, things were pretty unequal. Right? Some people lived in cities, some people lived in the countryside. And this is generally unequal. People in the cities have many more opportunities. There's, there's huge economies of living in a city. People in the countryside tend to be poor. They tend to be much more closer to subsistence farming. And this was a problem. So what do you do when you have two populations that are so unequal, and your goal is to bring about equality? So what do you do? Well, the taxes, it takes a long time, and who, who do you give the money to, and what are the people exactly going to do? They're still in the countryside. There are only so many opportunities they have even to invest in the countryside. No, I mean, th these guys, they wanted to do this quickly. This was not something that was going to take generations. 
They wanted results like this. So what you do is you empty the cities. You literally walk everybody out of the cities into the countryside. So you eliminate the gap. Now everybody's in the countryside. Everybody has to either forage or farm in order to survive. Literally marched, forced marched out of the cities. The problem then is that even in the countryside, people are not equal. Some people are better educated. Some people can read. Some people cannot. Some people are smart. Some people are not. What do you do? I mean, there are real inequalities here. Some people are good at foraging food, and some people are not good at foraging food. Some people are good at growing food. Some people are not good at growing food. So what do you do? Kill the rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not funny. Because that's the solution. It's not the rich, because at this point they aren't rich. But it's kill anybody who has more ability than everybody else. So if you wore glasses, it was a sign you could probably read, and you were maybe wealthier and more intellectual, they shot you. If you could read, if you went to school, they shot you. If you showed any sign of ability that was more than the average, whatever the hell that was, they shot you. They basically killed between 30 to 40 percent of their entire population in a very short period of time. Now this is a true story. This is the killing fields of Cambodia. This is the Khmer Rouge. All very intellectual, well-educated, studied in Paris, came home to Cambodia and wanted to manifest the ideology of equality. And this happens every time equality is taken seriously. Equality of outcome <coughs> is taken seriously. Because there's no other way to do it. You know, why stop at money? What about skills, abilities, talents? Well, don't we want equality? Good looks? I don't know. By any parameter, how do you establish equality among people? Well, you have to constrain. You have to limit. Or you just kill the people who stick out. In Australia, there's a term, the tall poppies. Chop them down. So in my view, the idea of equality of outcome is a vicious, evil ideology that leads to nothing but death and destruction. Inequality is what comes when you leave people free. And we can talk about how do you solve the problems of real problems of economic growth, the real problems of poverty, the real problems of mobility. But none of those problems get solved by setting up an ideal of equality, none of those problems get solved by turning inequality into a problem it is not. Inequality is a feature of freedom, not a bug, not a problem, but a feature. And if they're real problems, and they're all real problems, I'm not here to deny any of the problems that exist out there, then you got to solve those problems without pretending, without creating a false narrative and a false enemy without penalizing those who actually create value, those who are actually part of the solution, not the problem. So inequality is irrelevant economically and morally, it just is. It just is. And if you value freedom, then you have to be pro-inequality not anti-inequality. Thank you. Thank you for your ready talk. We'll now open the floor to questions. I hope you have plenty to ask. Where should we start? Uh, yes, yeah, in the glasses. Um, hi, I'm Sam <laughs> Ray. Um, so, one of the things I thought was interesting, you talked about your sort of um, view of the economy, not as being driven by consumption, but by production. Yeah. Um, an idea that's come back into interest, especially in America, was the idea of universal basic income, which they justified a lot on the terms that it won't necessarily cause a drain in the economy, 
because people that don't need it will use it through consumption and will re enter the economy and drive around. Do you see that then as viable? Do you think it's a possibility of driving the economy through such a, uh, such a project? Could it work? Thank you. <laughs> So no, I, you know, I don't think it can work. I, I don't think it's an economic problem. It might be a social solution, but you're giving up economic growth in order to do it. Now, it might not be a lot of growth, so I'm not against UBI in that sense. Uh, from an economic perspective, we can talk about moral perspective, but because the only way UBI can be presented legitimately, and even Andrew Yang, who in the presidential campaign in America is making this quite popular, is if it replaces other redistributionist policies. So for in Yang's plan, if you choose to accept universal basic income, I think his is a thousand dollars a month or something like that, then you have to forgo all other welfare, right? All other government goodies. Now how exactly that'll work is hard for me to say, but I'll, I'll leave it to Yang, who's not going to be president, so we'll never we'll never know. Um, <laughs> But, so, I think to the extent that it replaces, then it's not going to have that big of a fiscal impact, right? Because you're just moving money from one part into another part. Um, now, UBI will probably be higher because everybody gets UBI, even if you're not on welfare, you know, everybody accesses it. But it's not an economic solution. It's a way, you know, how does Yang present it? How do most UBI present it? They start with another economic fallacy, and the other economic fallacy is that robots are going to take all our jobs, right? And so they start with the idea that technology is going to decrease the number of jobs that are available. So some people are going to be just unemployed or unemployable, and therefore we have to help them sustain themselves. So we have to give UBI. It's the only way to keep people from starving. <coughs> and it's more efficient than, than welfare. So I think that's a fallacy to begin with. I don't think technology destroys jobs. I think, you know, you guys have had Luddites in this country since the uh, early 19th century or late 18th century, and they ne they're never right. Technology increases the number of jobs, doesn't decrease the number of jobs. Every new technology has increased the amount of work to be done, not decreased the amount of work to be done. And that's because the human needs Human desires are infinite. There's no limit to how much we want, and how much we need, and how much we desire. I need my iPhone. I didn't need it 20 years ago, but now I need my iPhone. Right? Our needs keep increasing. So I think it's based on this fallacy about lack of jobs. And then it's, it's based on the idea that consumption drives the economy, which I think is also a fallacy. But in terms of being more efficient than the welfare state, yeah, I mean, it is. Right? If you truly did away with welfare, and you replace it with UBI, then it's more efficient. I still think it's wrong, but it's more efficient. Uh, questions? Yes. Hi. Um, I just wanted to push back on what you said about there being no economic theory that connects the gap in wealth with economic success. I mean, Marxian economic theory does that just as well, and it actually influences things like neoclassical labor theory. So that's my real question is, how does one come to acquire private property what does it mean to possess private property legitimately? Okay, um, so first let me just say about Marxist economics, labor theory of value, come on guys, I mean labor theory of value is 150 years old, it's been disproven over and over and over and over again. So yes, there are theories that describe all kinds of mythology, but is there a legitimate theory that describes the connection? No, Marx was wrong on everything, um, and, and he's been shown wrong on everything, and when he's tried even a little bit, it leads to utter disaster and catastrophe. So I, I don't consider Marx uh, in that sense, in today's world, a legitimate economic theory, because I don't think it is. Um, and labor theory of value, by the way, is just being disproven over and over and over again. And in the 21st century, the idea that labor is what produces stuff is absurd. What, 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 is, what, what is the cause and means of production is the human mind. It's thinking. It's innovation, it's entrepreneurship. That's what drives an economy. It's not physical manual labor. How is private property acquired? Well, it depends how you want to set your starting point, right? And uh, I, I don't think it makes any I don't think it makes any sense to set some starting point as as, as time zero, because there is no time zero. We live in the world in which we live. Private property, the primary way in which private property is acquired is by its creation. 
I had, I, I moved to the United States in 1987. My private property included uh, two suitcases of clothes, one box of books, which I couldn't give up, right? And, uh, and, I, I, and I had $10,000 of cash. That was my starting point. Since then, uh, you know, today if I had to move, you'd, you'd have to fill, you know, probably two rooms this size with all my stuff that I would have to move across the thing. I went from two suitcases to two rooms full of stuff like this. How did that happen? How did I acquire all this stuff? By creating value. By creating it. All of this stuff is something I produced. I did work that created value for somebody who paid me money, and I used that money to acquire that stuff. So that by gaining the private property, by creating private property, by creating a service or value that other people paid me for. That's how private property is accumulated. It's not, you know, very few of us inherit stuff. That, that's, you know, maybe in an older country like the UK, more of you are going to get inherited wealth. But most of us, we have to create it ourselves. And, private, and how come, I mean, the, 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 and private property is not land and buildings because private property primarily is held as, as, as a, in a monetary form. Um, and most of us accumulate monetary wealth through work, through production, through creation of value. So it's created. Private property is created out of nothing, in a sense, out of your own mind. No questions? Yes. I'm entitled to five minutes, right? I'm entitled to five minutes for a second. Floor speeches usually try to keep to a minute, yes, if possible. One minute. <laughs> you can go a little bit over. Five uh, minutes of time to uh, so I, I wanted to address a couple of things. In fact, uh, I was thinking of the post with Big Head in 2017, Professor Daniel Markovich from Yale yes, School. Yale, yes. I, I won't go into it though because you're, you presented the same case, and I think it's not worth to just bring up his response and ask if you would readdress them if you just say the same. So I wanted to. You can all see the video on my YouTube yeah. channel if you want uh, to. <laughs> it doesn't fare too well, I'm sorry. So, uh, with regard to the uh, other aspects of objectivism that you didn't really address in this case, I wanted to ask two questions about Ayn Rand's philosophy, see what sure. you stand on those. Sure. So, uh, number one, uh, given that uh, we have you know, Ayn Rand presenting things like uh, the essence of femininity is to worship a man, uh, the ideal woman is a man worshiper, and women's essence is to submit themselves to men. I was just wondering whether, for one, as a happy married modern man, uh, you would be willing to disagree with the medieval ideas uh, of your institute's namesakes with regard to gender roles, and also whether you would uh, want to articulate the more general critique about Ayn Rand's objectivism, which places men so far above women that women basically become socially irrelevant. And I'll be very brief again. Uh, Can I just ask you before that, have you yes. read anything by Ayn Rand? Yes, okay. I actually have. You, have you read Atlas Shrugged? I have read the ones that you're in. Atlas Shrugged, have you read? Yes, I have. Okay, good. And uh, it's disgusting. Uh, so, right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just a quick Wait, note with regard to what you also talk about uh, when it comes to... Um, so that's a big question. Uh, are we yeah. going to take two? Uh, it's short, isn't it? Because it's essentially yes or no on whether women are subservient to men. It's not a yes or no answer. And one more question. Yes. So uh, this goes down to the idea of uh, discrimination based upon sexuality. So Ayn Rand calls homosexuals hideous in the uh, wonderful essay The Age of Envy, which I've also read and hated. And uh, she also comes to the idea, and you disagree with that on that, I assume, but I'd like to hear it. And she also says that there should be no effort by the state to outlaw pr private discrimination. So when I have a private business, they can discriminate upon individuals. And I do agree with her on that. Okay. Why? Good, good. Okay. Um, <laughs> feminine masculinity. And the idea that women are subservient to men, if you've read out the shrug, is just such an explicit lie. Because you read the book. This is 1957. The heroine of the book is Dagny Taggart. She runs a railroad. She has thousands of men reporting to her. They basically are all doing what she tells them to do. She is the strongest woman character that I know in all of literature. I don't know a stronger woman. No, you've asked the question. I don't know a stronger woman in all of literature than Dagny Taggart is in Atlas Shrugged. The idea, no, I don't want to quote. The idea that she is subservient to a man is ridiculous. Now, yes, Ayn Rand had a particular view a femininity and masculinity, which applies specifically to sex. Not to how you live your life on a day-to-day -day basis and who you report to and who's subservient to whom, but in sex. She viewed a 
a woman is worshipping of a hero, a male hero, and a, a man being dominant in sex. Now, first, this is not philosophy. This is psychology. It's not part of objectivism. It is a psychological idea, not a philosophical idea. And I know many objectivists who disagree with that idea. But it has nothing to do with apolitical rights and how you would treat women on a day-to-day -day basis. Ayn Rand was a woman, ultimately, right? Um, and, and, and she certainly was not subservient to any man uh, in, in, in her day-to-day -day life or in her profession. Anyway, I mean, she, if she was a feminist in a, in a true sense of the word, in a sense of women can do anything before there was such thing as feminism. Because, again, Dagny Taggart, not only is she running a real world, she initiates sex, she is a dominant character within that book, and to view that book as somehow women are subservient, given how strong of a character it is, is just, you know, questionable dishonesty there. Um, so that's with regard to, to sex. With regard to homosexuality, yes, Ayn Rand was born in 1905. She had what I think are wrong views on homosexuality, uh, which were very common among her generation. She never, by the way, said it was immoral. She never said you should discriminate against homosexuals. She had friends, close friends, who were homosexuals. She just found it repugnant personally, which I disagree with. I don't find it repugnant personally. I, again, I have... So, uh, uh, but you asked something else. Oh, yeah, about discrimination. Yes, she did believe, and I believe, that politically, you as an individual have a right to discriminate. You have a political right to discriminate. You have a political right to say, I don't want to deal with those people because they're green, because they're blue, because I don't like their eyes, because I don't like their whatever, right? You have a right to discriminate. And if you own, I, I discriminate in terms of who comes to my house. I only invite people to my house that I like. <laughs> people I don't like, I don't invite. I'm very discriminating. Her argument is when you have a store, when you have a private premise, then you should be allowed to decide who comes in and who not. If somebody wants to put up a sign saying, and I'll use myself as an example, no Jews allowed, then they have a right to say no Jews allowed. Now, if somebody put up a sign like that, I think every decent human being would boycott that store. Nobody would want to go into that store. I certainly would boycott anybody who discriminated in that sense. But they have a right. That's what private property means. And one of the great tragedies of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is that it included uh, not just that the government could discriminate, which the government should never discriminate, calling for the law, but it included that private you couldn't discriminate on private property, which I think is a mistake, and will ultimately, I think, create more racism than it solves, and you're seeing that already in America with the rise of racism. I think to a large extent that is a consequence of not allowing people to express themselves, not allowing people to, to, to discriminate, and boycotting them and treating them like the moral idiots that they are, right, or the moral evil that they are. A few more questions, please. Try and come a little bit through Yeah. And, uh, yes. Yeah. Try not to ruin the place. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I do philosophy. And yeah. uh, in yeah. philosophy, I'm not very very no. seriously. Yeah. Um, I mean, I tried to write something about her, and then the supervisor just told me I can't write about her. Um, and so, why do you think that is? Like, why do you think ideas aren't taken seriously into the philosophy? Is it not analytical enough? Some people say that she's not self critical enough, and do you think that's a problem? Yeah, you no, know, I don't think uh, it's a problem that she's not self-critical enough. I don't think Aristotle's very self-critical, uh, and yet people take him seriously. I don't think Immanuel Kant is very self-critical at all. And he's quite, you know, strong, and yet people take him very seriously. So I don't think that's it. I think it's very modern to think that self-criticism is a good thing. Um, no, when you have an idea, you have an idea. You're not supposed to criticize. Other people will criticize it, and you'll, 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 uh, you know, confront it. So I think the reason, the primary reason. Rand is not yet, and I think this will change over time, taking seriously in philosophy department, is uh, there are basically, I think, two reasons. One is, who ideas are radical. They're revolutionary. They're very, very different than, the, than, than what precedes. I think philosophy departments are be dominated by a certain school of thought that, that primarily comes from Germany and, and the German line of thinking. And she is very, very different from that. And she approaches every single issue from metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, to all the way to aesthetics, very differently, and put in there as well that politically she is a capitalist. She believes in real free markets and very, very limited government. That is so politically anathema to most philosophers that they don't even look at the ideas because 
politics is so important in their mind, although it shouldn't be. You know, you, you should judge a philosophy based on the philosophy, not based on its political outcomes. I think that's one reason. The second reason is that Rand actually writes in English. In other words, she writes in a way that's understandable. And that's viewed as simplistic and unphilosophical and non-analytical and non-complex. So she writes in a different language than most philosophers write. They write, you know, I think they, 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 they uh, you know, love complexity. They love making it difficult to understand and, and they follow Kant in that sense. If you ever try to read a sentence by Kant, you know how awfully hard it is to comprehend what it is he's talking about. And I think they, everybody models themselves after Kant after that. She actually writes in sentences that normal individuals can actually understand. And they find that, I think, offensive. So I think those two things. There is a great book called The Companion to Iron Man Studies, written for philosophers from the perspective of trying to translate Ayn Rand into, uh, you know, so how they should approach Ayn Rand if they're serious about studying her, uh, written by philosophers who take her seriously. And uh, so I think, I think over time it's going to change, but it takes a long time. And, and uh, unfortunately in our culture, generally in our world, politics has been elevated to the most important thing in life. And everybody is judged based on where they fall in the political spectrum. And so she's dismissed because she falls, they think, on, on a particular place in the political spectrum. Politics is going to have to become less important for people to start really, you know, paying attention to important ideas. Other questions? Yes. Um, hi, Aaron. Last time I saw it was next, so it's a few yes. um, I'll try and keep it brief, but I'd like to start with a quote. Um, the bourgeoisie, during its rule of scarce 100 years, has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than have all preceding generations together. My question is concerned with the nature of the human condition. Man, by his nature, I submit, is a spiritual being. This is because, as Martin Heidegger argues in Being in Time, man's existence is an issue for him in a way that it isn't for other beings. The fact that existence presents itself as a mystery to us is why philosophies and religions and systems of metaphysics exist, to try and explain that mystery. I want to emphasize that spirituality is not the same as religion. One can be spiritual without being religious, and in my opinion, religion impedes genuine spirituality. Metaphysically, I'd also argue that capitalism and communism are two sides of the same coin, since each presuppose an underlying materialism. In so doing, they overlook man's underlying spiritual need. Materialism can be understood as the thesis that nothing but matter exists, but that's not how I mean it in the context of this debate. By materialism, I mean that man has nothing but physical needs and that happiness consists in the satisfaction of those needs. By your own admission today, objectivism, like all forms of materialism, reinforces the sense of the ego. You praise the ego clinging material goods. However, as a result of their impermanence, material goods can never grant lasting happiness to man. Only in so doing does one come to realise that material goods are empty. Materialism begs the question, to what end? To what end does one pursue material goods, instrumentalising all beings, treating none as ends in themselves, but only as means? Like Marx, no doubt, we can feel a sense of awe and wonder at the material achievements of capitalism, but what do you say to those who see behind these material achievements an underlying sense of emptiness? Is not the proclivity of so many today to throw themselves into, say, social media, technology, you cited the example of the iPhone, a testament to this underlying sense of emptiness? Hence, my question is twofold. One, do you recognise the spiritual dimension to what it means to be human? And two, does not objectivism, given its materialist metaphysic, undermine that spiritual need? Thanks. <laughs> so, I don't know what talk you were just at. <laughs> because I kept emphasizing that it's not about the material. Right? So, when I say I love doing this, there's nothing material about this. And last time I looked, the unions aren't paying me anything. <laughs> <laughs> I love doing this, and this is a spiritual value to me. Education, communication, contact with other human beings, seeing a light go off in somebody's eye when they say something that makes sense to them. That is an incredible spiritual experience. So, of course, we are dominantly spiritual beings that need material sustenance. 
And our spirituality and our materiality are not separate things. You can't, in my view, view the world as there's material over here and spirit over here. I think they're interconnected. I get immense spiritual value from material stuff. Right? My iPhone, for example, right? And I can listen, for example, to music on my iPhone. Music, the experience of listening to music and enjoying music is clearly a spiritual experience. And I also completely disagree with the idea that capitalism is materialistic. Quite the opposite. Capitalism is the only system in human history to allow space for true spirituality. Because it doesn't tell you what you must achieve, what you must do. All capitalism says is, we're going to leave you free. Go do what you think is good for you. What you believe is going to achieve your values. And those values don't have to be material. And I, again, I said, I could have gone to Wall Street, made a lot of money, and I chose to be a teacher. So I chose a less material value. And I chose to have a, a spiritual experience. And I think capitalism and spirituality, again, go together. There's no accident that the 19th century, the, the most capitalist century in a sense, was also the one in which we produced some of the greatest artworks, particularly music, that we've ever produced. Because they go hand in hand. Freedom encourages material creation, but it also encourages spiritual creation, which then we can consume. So, you know, if you know a little bit about the history of music, Beethoven is the first composer, right? First composer to actually make money off of selling his work, right? If you were Mozart, what did you, who did you depend on? Like you always had a patron and you had to grovel before the patron to, to, to let you write the music and to, and to earn a living. But Beethoven could sell tickets to concerts. And because there was a bourgeois, Right? Because it was a middle class. They were not buying pianos and they wanted sheet music and Beethoven could make money off of the sheet music that he was selling. So suddenly he was a capitalist. But he was primarily providing spiritual values to people. And he was, and he was providing spiritual values to himself. So I don't see a conflict. I see Marxism explicitly is materialistic. Capitalism is not. Capitalism is just a system that leaves people free to pursue their values whatever those values happen to be. And you're right in the sense that people who are overly consumed by materialism, by just making more money for the sake of making more money, you can make more money for other sakes, but for just, are usually unhappy and usually are looking for something more. But I don't believe most billionaires, for example, take somebody like Jeff Bezos, I don't, or, or Steve Jobs is even a better example. I don't think that's what consumed them. I don't think they're consumed by making more money. I don't think money represents more than just a marker of how they're doing from a, from, a, from a business perspective. But their life is a spiritual life. You know, Steve Jobs got spiritual pleasure from building this and making this and designing it beautifully and doing all that. So I think it's a false dichotomy that Marxism, unfortunately, has embedded in our mind. Right, the, 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 it's all about the material, it's all about labor, it's all about stuff. And it's not, it's about, and I gave the example of Tricky Rollins, right? And what did I say? What's the enjoyment of, of, of reading Harry Potter book? That's a spiritual value that I paid a lot of money to get. And it's a, but it far exceeds the amount of money that I got. I got much more value out of reading with my kids and experiencing the books themselves. That makes sense? We can follow up later. <laughs> Further questions? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, great speech. Thank you. Um, you've argued that inequality and poverty are not connected. Um, and you said that we create our own pies. Um, but one of the key objections to my speech was that I think that you don't give enough credit to kind of a lack of equality of opportunity and how it can be connected to poverty. Um, for example, even in your desert, like your desert island situation, everyone was the same to start with, and then became unequal. But that just doesn't seem realistic in the, in the modern world. Um, in the UK society, with inherent, inherited wealth, private schools, and the great geographical differences between us, um, it seems to me that there's a clear unfair advantage at birth uh, that means that wealth is not necessarily a testament to your success, nor is poverty a testament to failure somehow. Um, and sort of a second point to that, um, the idea that life is not about money um, seems like quite an elite idea coming from the perspective of someone who has money um, and therefore has the freedom to value spiritual pleasure over money because it's not something they have to worry about greatly. Um, 
how do you respond to this, and how do you justify the lack of connection between inequality and poverty? Sure. So first, you know, I haven't always had money, so it's, I mean, that's, you earn the money. You, you, you have to gain it. It doesn't just come at you. And look, I'm not denying, and I didn't intend to deny the fact that we have different opportunities. We do. You, you can't compare the opportunity somebody has who goes to, uh, you know, who gets sent to Eton and, and uh, then is almost guaranteed to be prime minister at some point, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and somebody whose parents can barely survive and, and are struggling to, to somehow make a living and, and send them to whatever school they can because they don't have any choices. Um, that difference exists. And, and it does, it, it just, it, and it exists no matter what you do, part of my argument is you're always gonna have inequality. Some parents are loving parents, and some parents are not very good. There's really bad parents out there, nasty people, who raise kids in horrible ways. And yet those two kids are gonna have different opportunities because of the way they were raised. My point is that those kind of inequalities, they exist. Trying to remedy them by penalizing those who have more is a really, really bad solution to problems like that. So what we need to do is find ways within the context of freedom to eliminate those really bad constraints that hold people back. Um, so let me give you, uh, you know, let me give you a few examples of that. But let me first say this about poverty because I think it's really important. Poverty is our natural state. Before capitalism, and I know this is not, I mean, the Marxists know this because Karl Marx actually admitted this, but other than that, most people don't know this. And before capitalism, what were 99% of people? Poor. Everybody was poor. So, for example, today the UN defines extreme poverty as, I think, $2 a day or less. How many people lived on $2 a day or less in 1750? Extreme poverty. I mean, imagine today, and we're talking about equal dollars, so I'm not playing a, an inflation game, right? I mean, you couldn't live on two dollars a day or less today in England. But in 1750, how many people in England lived on two dollars a day or less? Yeah, basically 90 something percent. Everybody was poor, and that's true throughout human history. So if you go back a hundred thousand years. Throughout that entire period, with a few exceptions, maybe in Greece and Rome, where people got a little bit wealthier for a little period of time, everybody's lived on two bucks a day or less forever. And then we had this amazing thing happen called freedom, capitalism, the Industrial Revolution, a portion of that. And suddenly, we became relatively rich. I mean, even, and I don't want to dismiss poverty, but even the poorest person today in, in the UK is dramatically richer than the richest person 200 years ago. Than the richest person 200 years ago. Because they have running water, they have electricity, they have telephone service, they have things that were unimaginable to the richest human being on planet Earth 200 years ago. So, if you, if, if you, if you have, if you just leave people alone in a sense, with, with no, you know, no protections, no, um, no rule of law, what you get is everybody's poor. Right? What you get is conditions in, in, unfortunately, still parts of the world today. By the way, how many people today on planet Earth live on $2 a day or less? It used to be 90-something percent. How many today? Billion. Uh, percentage. It's 20, roughly. 20. Anybody else? How is it? Like a billion people. So a billion people, we've got eight. So what is that? That's over 10% somewhere, over 10%. I, and by the way, 30 years ago, how many people lived in two dollars a day or less? Just anybody want to guess? Half, oh, half, fifty percent, thirty. Thirty. Okay, so here are the numbers. Thirty years ago, thirty percent. You were right. Of of the population of the Earth lived on two dollars a day or less. Today, eight percent. We have cut the rate of extreme poverty dramatically. All over the world, and you can you can check these. These are UN numbers, not an organization. I use these sites, but anyway, UN numbers, right? Why? How did we do that? Foreign aid, charity. How did that happen? China. A lot of it's China, but how did China happen? I mean, that, that just <laughs> begs the question, right? 
mean, industrialization, but how does industrialization help? Resources. I mean, no, resources. No. Resources. Hong Kong has no resources. Okay. How does it happen? Freedom. A little bit of freedom. Capitalism is another word. Right? Freedom. You let people alone, which is what the Chinese did in the certain provinces. And all the wealth is created in those provinces. The rest are pretty poor. Poverty goes away whenever you advance capitalism. Whenever you advance the idea of equality before the law, you protect property rights, and otherwise you leave people alone. Then wealth is created and poverty is eradicated. And we're seeing that before our eyes today. And this is the biggest story in all of human history, and nobody cares, that like 2 billion people have come out of poverty over the last 30 years, and nobody seems to care about that. But that's a fact. So if you care about the poor, which I do, then the solution is not to hand them a check. The solution is to create a world in which there are jobs, in which there's wealth being created, in which there are opportunities, in which there's a great educational system accessible to as many people as possible, which we don't have today. And how do you do that? How do you get economic growth? How do you get great education? Through capitalism, through freedom. I think the biggest problem with education today is that the government runs it. Now I know you guys, you know, you guys love public education. Public education in America means government education. Um, but the government, you know, I always ask audiences, what do you think this would look like if the government built it? Yeah, you all laugh. Everybody always laughs. So we don't trust the government to make an iPhone, but education, that they can do. Education is like a million times more important than this. So important that I wouldn't want a government bureaucrat anywhere near it. I want the same innovation. Whoops, I just called somebody. <laughs> I want the same innovation. I want the same competition. I want the same brain power applied to education as applied to this thing. As applied to the next Angry Birds 27. <coughs> right? The, the next app on this thing. Instead of building apps for this, go build a school. Go come up with a new curriculum. Go innovate in the field of education. But you don't get that unless you privatize it. So if you want better schools for poor kids, the worst schools, the worst schools in the United States, I'll talk about the United States because I know something about that, the worst schools are the schools serving poor kids. And that's government schools. And it's not about money because they pour money into it. It's about the fact that they're bureaucratized and standardized and rigid and run by unions and they don't have innovation, they don't have competition, they don't produce stuff. So you want that? Create competition. Privatize. Get the, the, the juices going, the competitive juices of entrepreneurs going in the field of education. So the solution to poverty is more freedom, not less freedom. The solution to poverty is more opportunities, not less opportunities, not restricting opportunities. And the way you get more opportunities is more freedom, which means more you know, less government intervention in the economy and in education and in healthcare and in everything else. You want to expand the scope of opportunity. So I'm not for equality of opportunity. I don't believe in such a thing. I don't think that's possible. You know what I'm for? I'm for maximizing opportunities. Because when you maximize opportunities, anybody who wants to succeed in life has the opportunity to do so. And the way you maximize opportunities is through free markets, it's through freedom, it's through capitalism, it's through leaving people alone to produce and create. We have time for one more question. He's being patient. Go ahead, Mitchell. What do you think is the biggest issue facing the West today? So, like old age, technology, conflict with China. Like, what, what, you, what in your mind is the fundamental issue that the West has to contend with? None of the above. <laughs> I think the biggest issue facing not just the West, but I think the world, because I, I think the, the differentiation now between the West and the rest of the world. Is being, you know, is, is going away. I think the biggest issue is the rise of what I call tribalism, collectivism. Um, and the biggest conflict we face today in the West and in the rest of the world, really, is the, the, the conflict, which is historical and, and we've had it for uh, 2,000 years or whatever, between individualism and collectivism. Between the right of the individual to live his life as he sees fit or the, 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 the use of force in order to force him to conform to some standard set by the tribe 
by the leader of the tribe. You've seen that in the United States as we're becoming more and more and more tribal. Um, you've seen that, I think, in, in, in you know, I, I don't know enough about the UK, but I suspect that's happening in the UK. And you're certainly seeing it all over Europe. You're seeing it on the left and you're seeing it on the right. So it's not a left-right issue. Generally, I, I think both left and right are awful. I, I, I don't consider myself anywhere in that spectrum. I don't want to touch either people on the left or, you know, I'm, I view the political spectrum, the proper political spectrum, going from individualism, which means freedom, which means liberty, which means a, a limited government that leaves you alone to pursue your values. But it's not just political. Individualism means a moral right to live your life for the sake of your own happiness, to make your life the best life that it can be, versus collectivism, tribalism, which says your life morally doesn't belong to you. Your life morally belongs to the state or to the tribe or to the group. And therefore, you can be sacrificed for the sake of of the tribe, or the state, or the group, right? So your life is not an end in itself for you. It's, it's a means to somebody else's end. And that's the spectrum. The spectrum is between, are you just a cog in some group's machine? Or are you a unique being whose moral duty, moral responsibility it is to live and make the most of your own life and to achieve what I think is the ultimate spiritual value, which is your own happiness. Because at the end of the day, I think life is about happiness and life is about living the best life you can for yourself and interacting with other people because other people have incredible values, spiritual and material, to the achievement of your own happiness. But it's your happiness which should be central. So that, I think, is the biggest challenge. I think, I think individualism came into its own, if you will, uh, in the Enlightenment, um, in, in, in this part of the world, and, and was, was defended philosophically to some extent by the Enlightenment figures, and manifested itself, I think, in the creation of the United States, which is a land of individuals, is dramatically in decline in, in the West, and therefore in the, in, also in the rest of the world, and tribalism is on the rise, and tribalism leads to violence, war, and oppression, and, and I think that's where we're heading, unless we reverse trends. Thank you.